Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the genius of Ravel's Mother Goose Ballet. Now, this is a talk I've wanted to do for quite a while because, you know, it's really, really interesting. Ravel is not usually considered to be a composer of, of like, formal gifts, but he had them. All great composers have them, one way or another. And Mother Goose, the ballet, is one of those unassuming works. People love it because it's gorgeous, of course, but it doesn't get a lot of attention from a strictly analytical point of view. Not that it needs to be analyzed. It's like, you know, just there. It's so beautiful. But yeah, if you do want to look a little deeper, you'll find some really interesting things. I'm going to talk about one aspect of it, hopefully briefly, with some musical examples taken from this lovely Naxos recording um, featuring the Orchestre Nationale de Lyon and Leonard Slatkin, coupled with a very good L'Enfant et des Sortillages, with a fabulous also fairy tale enchantment type ballet. I mean, opera. That's an opera and that's a ballet, but they're all about fairy tales, the world of children. So they go very well together. Now, Mother Goose, you have to understand that that's the concept here. Mother Goose began life as five children's pieces for piano four hands. Easy to play. I mean, I even played some of them, so I can tell you they were, they were pretty easy. And, and Ravel later orchestrated the suite, and then he blew it up into a complete ballet. Now, in order to blow it up into a complete ballet, he added, first of all, an opening dance, a sort of spinning wheel sort of dance thing. Um, and then interludes, an introduction and interludes between the numbers that comprised the original piano suite, because those numbers have absolutely nothing in common with each other, nothing whatsoever. Those pieces are, let's see, the dance of the spinning wheel, then the pavan of sleeping beauty, conversations between beauty and the beast, hop o' oh my thumb, which is Tom Thumb, you know, that little story there with, you know, the breadcrumbs and the birds eating them and all that stuff, you know. And, and uh, the little ugly empress of the pagodas, which is just delightful, faux Asian orientalist music. I just adore it. It has a tam-tam, really good one. And then the fairy garden at the very end which is simply one of the most beautiful things anybody and it ever sprang fully formed from the head of a musical genius. It's just unbelievable. So those were the five pieces and they have nothing, nothing in common musically. So in creating the ballet, Ravel wanted to somehow tie it all together. And he did that through a series of motives that occur in these interludes between the pieces. And he also anticipated the music to come in these interludes. He'd give you a hint of what the melody was of the next work. And so through that, he, he, he sort of united the whole thing. And there's one motive I just want to trace as it moves through the ballet, just to show you what an unbelievable genius this guy is. And it's the very opening. The very opening woodwind motive. Ya da 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 That's it. That's really all it is. It's as simple as can be. It's a little arpeggio theme. It's not really a melody. It's a thing. And 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 here it is, just so you can hear it. Very, very simple and lovely. And this little motive will occur at the opening of each of the interludes in one form or another. So you have the first thing, and then you get the spinning wheel business that gets, gets hopping. And after that gets hopping, we return to the opening motive, which is now developing. It's sort of changing into something else by being rescored and harmonized. So before we get the pavan of Sleeping Beauty or whatever the heck that thing was called, here is the return of the opening motive. Now you realize all of this is happening at a rather low dynamic level. 
It's very gentle. It's very mysterious. It's very atmospheric. Now, after that first appearance, we don't hear it in its original form till way at the end of the ballet. What Ravel did was he came up with a, a development, a melodic development of it, but it's the same idea, and you can clearly tell it's the same idea. I mean, if you have that in your head, e do 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 do, you know, like that. Just think of that while you hear this. That is a melodic elaboration of that opening motive. A wonderful little development. I mean, you know, if you were writing a symphony and he stuffed that in the development section, you would be saying, oh, look, what a clever development of the opening motive, because it really is. And this thing appears in the next three numbers, all always harmonized differently. You know, perhaps anticipating a little bit the harmonic atmosphere of the music to come, or perhaps not, you know. But because there's also other motives that appear in these in these interludes, which repeat, which recur as well. I mean, there's a whole little concatenation, a little family of them. But here's another version of that same melodic idea. A more a more diatonic, that harmonically sort of, you know, pleasant version of it. And then there's one more that we hear later, and here that one is. Or here is that one. Well, my syntax sometimes gets reversed. It doesn't matter. So there you go. That gets you through virtually all of the ballet. And these interludes are some, they're a couple minutes long. I mean, they're longer. There's more stuff in them. But that just shows you how that little tiny motive from the beginning gets developed throughout the ballet. Now, before we get to the fairy garden, and this is where things really get cool, Ravel brings us back to the very beginning of the ballet to tell us that we have come full cycle that we've returned to where we started, and now the conclusion is going to happen. And the opening woodwind tune appears as an accompaniment to that lovely solo violin bit that introduces the fairy garden, and here it is. Did you hear it there in the back? Well, then there is the glorious conclusion. And the glorious conclusion is actually, and this is something I swear to you, I've been listening to this piece for decades and I only just realized it. This is one of the things that makes these things so fascinating, listening to great music, because there's always something else to hear. There's always something that you didn't quite catch that somehow crystallizes and you go, aha, it locks in and it just reinvigorates your appreciation for just the, the beauty and the genius of these pieces. So the very ending is the only time we hear a loud version of that opening. It's so poetic in its soft incarnations that we don't even realize at the very end, the apotheosis of this entire ballet is a literal, literal version Da da ba 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 da ba ba ba. That's it. It's the opening, and here it is.
glorious. Glorious, isn't it? But now comes the genius part, the amazing genius part. You know, it, the ballet leads up to that ending, that amazing apotheosis, and a steady stepwise development that's incredibly fulfilling just of that one motive. I mean, forget all the other stuff that's in it, but it's, it works fabulously well. But the, the genius thing, the thing that just blew my mind is this. Ravel wrote that ending first. I mean, that was the, one of the original piano pieces. There were no interludes before when he wrote the thing. That was just the ending of the whole, the whole suite of piano pieces. And so from that loud ending, he worked backwards. He actually derived the opening of the ballet from the ending of the piano piece. And I just think that is so incredibly cool because he must have been scratching his head saying, hmm, huh. How am I going to start this thing? And how am I going to tie it all together? And what, what can I use? What material can I use? And he looked at the end of it and saw, well, the end is just a simple harmonic, harmonic sort of arpeggio formula. Ba, 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 like that. And he said, aha, that's what I need. I need that. And so he took that and he transformed it into the beginning of the ballet and these interludes that occur until it leads with unbelievable, satisfying inevitability to those concluding bars. And that, my friend, is genius. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.